thermometry is kind of a key safety diagnostic to make sure that we're well controlled. Thermometry. Thermometry. What, if it gets too hot, you're in trouble or? Sodium expands when it heats. Uh -huh. The vessel has a certain volume. Uh -huh. There's a temperature above which it's over full. And it's better not to be over full. <laughs> what temperature is that? Uh, I think it's around 130 degrees. Have you ever been See, close? No. No, because our thermometries have, we have thermometry and backup thermometry and backup to the backup thermometry. Yeah, <laughs> Let's back up and explain what is this thing? This is a three meter sphere of molten sodium. That is 12.5 tons of hot liquid metal designed to spin at up to four revolutions per second. 3.95 hertz. And at that rate, the outer surface of the sphere is moving at over 130 kilometers an hour. That's over 80 miles per hour. And basically, it's representing the Earth. What they're trying to do is find out how the Earth's magnetic field is generated. And some of the first scientists to study this, starting with William Gilbert in 1600, proposed that the Earth was a huge permanent magnet. Now today, we know that the inner core of the Earth is solid, and it's mostly made up of iron and nickel, which are ferromagnetic elements. However, the temperature of the inner core is nearly 6,000 Kelvin, which is way above their Curie temperatures, and so there is no way that they could maintain a permanent magnetic field. The same is true of the solid mantle of the Earth. Much of it is way too hot for permanent magnets, which leaves only the liquid metal outer core as the place where Earth's magnetic fields could be generated. And this is what is modeled by the three meter spinning sphere of molten sodium. It needs to be as large as practicable. It needs to be as high speed as practicable. And we use liquid sodium because it's the best electric conductor of any liquid. So it has the downsides of being hazardous and flammable, but <laughs> the failure would be modestly catastrophic. <laughs> that, that's got a weird twist of phrase, but it's... Modestly catastrophic. Yeah. Most buildings have sprinkler systems in case of fire, but not this lab. To see why, take a look at a single drop of water falling on a single drop of molten sodium. Now multiply that by 12.5 tons, and you have modestly catastrophic. But the researchers have thought about this, and they have a plan. There is a liquid nitrogen doer that sits up top. So one of these, mostly full, you could just hit a switch and dump the entire contents of liquid nitrogen on top of the experiment. So this is like a, a physicist's super fire extinguisher then? You know, it's a backup plan. The plan is no leak, no fire. The backup plan, put the fire out with cryogenics. It actually works great. This is 300 degrees colder than the sodium. And so uh, sodium cannot burn in nitrogen gas atmosphere, and the cold freezes it, and the leak gets frozen, and everything just chills. But when everything's working normally, how is a spinning sphere of liquid metal meant to generate a magnetic field? Well, for the Earth, the thinking goes like this. First, as the Earth radiates heat into space, its core cools. This means the solid inner core is growing, as iron and nickel from the outer core solidify at the boundary. Now this leaves some lighter elements, like sulfur for example, behind in the outer core. And so patches with those lighter elements experience a buoyant force and rise away from the core in turbulent convection currents. Now add to this the fact that the Earth is rotating. The rotation causes those convection currents to spiral around an axis roughly parallel with the Earth's axis of rotation. These spiraling turbulent flows of liquid metal can trap magnetic field lines, and as they move and stretch the field, they create electric currents that produce more magnetic fields. If the magnetic fields are generated faster than they dissipate due to the resistance of the metal, well, then you have a self-sustaining electric generator, or a dynamo. We talk about the dynamo generation of magnetic fields to mean when you have a turbulent conductor let's say convecting like the core, that spontaneously generates a magnetic field. If you have a little bit of current that happens, it causes a little bit of magnetic field that couples into the motion, that causes more currents, that causes more magnetic fields, that couples into the motion, and then you're just converting motion to currents. But it, it, goes, kinda, on, it goes unstable. That's kind of counterintuitive though, because you started out with no magnetic field, so how do you get no, the current in the first place? You know what I mean? Like, no, no, just it, all, you, all you need is a little infinitesimal amount, a thermal, variation, a random current, will just grow to full size. So once something's unstable, actually, you don't really care where the, the tickle came from. 
The states we have now don't generate their own magnetic field, so we've not reached the dynamo threshold, although the hope is to do so in a modified version of the experiment. So we apply magnetic fields from the outside and then look at the amplification of those magnetic fields by the rotating turbulence. And we get uh, copious amounts of amplification depending on where we are in the operating conditions. Um, for instance, when we apply these external magnetic fields, sort of go through the experiment like that, they get twisted up by the flow, and the magnetic fields in the angular direction can be up to 10 times larger than the fields we apply. So we actually have lots of gain, even though we do not yet have a closed loop dynamo. So why is it important to understand the Earth's magnetic field? We know the Earth's magnetic field is part of what makes the Earth a habitable planet. One of the ways is that it forms a shield, the magnetosphere, which deflects the worst parts of the solar storms around. But lately that shield appears to be weakening. So the Earth's magnetic field has dropped 10% in the last 170 years. We don't know why. There's a very weak spot of the Earth's magnetic field in the South Atlantic, the South Atlantic anomaly, that's growing weaker. We do know the Earth's magnetic field has reversed many hundreds of times in its history. We don't know where it's going now. We actually don't currently have a predictive science of the Earth's magnetic field. Why is that important? So the Earth's magnetic field has weather. It has changes. You might want to have a forecast for planning purposes. Will this spinning sphere make that forecasting possible? It's an experiment, so no one has run a device like this ever. It's world unique, so you don't entirely know what's going to happen when you run it. But that's why we do experiments. So in fact, we don't know whether it's possible or not to predict the Earth's future magnetic field. It's an open question. Hey, so in about a week, I am taking the 13-hour flight to Sydney. I am touring the country and launching a new feature-length documentary. There's more info in the description. But on that flight will be my wife and my two kids who are two and under. And I kind of have these visions whereby if I do get a moment to myself, I am going to sit back and relax with the sponsor of today's video, which is Audible, the leading provider of audiobooks. And the book I will be listening to is Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Uh, it's about his life growing up in South Africa. It opens with him getting pushed out of a car by his mother. Um, and it's actually read by Trevor Noah. And he is South African. My family comes from South Africa. And I would love to learn more about the country and about his experience of growing up there. Not to mention the fact that it is a very, very funny book. So if you're interested in listening to this book, you can actually download it for free for a 30-day trial of the Audible service by going to audible.com slash veritasium or by texting veritasium to 500-500. You know, with an Audible membership, every month you get a credit. And you can use that credit to get any book you like. And if you don't like that book after you've listened Listen to some of it, you can uh, return it and get that credit back. And if you don't use a credit in a given month, it rolls over to the next month. And if you ever cancel your membership, well, all your books are still yours to keep and you can listen to them whenever you like. So they don't just stop because you stopped your membership. So those are the things I like about uh, Audible. If you are out traveling and you want to get some more stories into your life, I highly recommend you give them a shot. Um, just go to audible.com slash veritasium or text veritasium to 500-500. So I want to thank Audible for supporting me, and I want to thank you for watching. Fingers crossed I will get some time to listen to this book on the plane.